Hi, I'm Mike, one of the InGroove in Phoenix, Arizona. Today I'm going to do another video essentially showing you guys what I am taking from the store, what I have purchased on my own on eBay for my personal collection. Uh, records that I'm going to put on the shelf and they're going to remain there for a long, long time. The first thing I wanted to show you guys was actually this uh, month's Vinyl Me Please subscription. I think I now have three of the four subscriptions. Some months there's three records I want, some months there's one, but I typically always get at least one record from the Vinyl Me Please series that I keep for myself. The benefit for me is I have a store. If I'm not a fan of it, I can sell it. <laughs> so I don't know if that, that's a something I would recommend for everybody, but let me show you the first of the two that came out that I got this month. There was a third one. Maybe that never made its way from the store. That might have been the country track. Bruce Springsteen, Nebraska. And then I have Ornette Coleman, The Shape of Jazz to Come. This is actually a uh, mono pressing. You can see it has the mono label. So the Ornette Coleman, I listen to both of these. The Ornette Coleman is analog, cut from the original mono tapes by Ryan Smith pressed on 180 gram black audio file vinyl at RTI. Let me crack this open. So when I actually got originals, I compared both of these again. These now, I brought these home just to listen to them to make a decision essentially what I wanted to do as far as keeping them or not. I planned on keeping the Ornette Coleman just because it's an audio file record. I'm not a huge Bruce Springsteen fan, but actually that's the one album of his I actually like. It's weird because not being a Bruce Springsteen fan, the feedback I get is that's the Bruce Springsteen fan or Bruce Springsteen album that fans tend to like the least. So, yeah. So, let me show you this. They did a killer job on this. I'm actually going to keep the Ornette Coleman. I love, I think Vinyl Me Please at this point in time has the hands down best jackets in the industry. They're heavy, tip on jackets high gloss, real high quality foil embossing. They typically embellish with spot gloss. They do, you know, they go all out. The only thing I will complain about incessantly is these stupid books that do almost nothing but warp the records. I, I've never even really looked at this. I have no idea why. A little essay in that. I, who reads these things? Maybe somebody reads these things. We don't need little miniature books. I would like to see these done away with. Like I said, more times than not, they damage the record because they jam them in there. But yeah, so the way I store them when I get them, assuming the record is not warped, I'll stuff it in there and be done with it. But really good. So I listened to this in comparison to, I've got an original mono pressing of this. It's not the uh, cleanest record in my collection. But it is a true first pressing. Plays really nice. The thing is with these old Atlantic records is they tend to play noisy. Even if you get mint copies, Atlantic was never really using the highest quality vinyl. So they tend to be a little on the noisy side. This is not a very busy record. There's not a lot going on musically. Uh, the Vinyl Me Please is really nice. It's quiet. It's easy to get because it's this month's new arrival as opposed to original Ornette which is gonna be expensive and pricey. That's a really good value. As far as the Nebraska, I'm gonna actually take this back to, I'm gonna take this back to the store. This I'll sell. I mean, the quality is great. I mean, don't get me wrong. If you're a fan of the album, if you're a Bruce completist, I mean, look what they've done here. I mean, it's the highest of quality. You know, they vile on me, please, essential oil embossing. I mean, it's high quality, but has a little artwork print there. Let's see. Black smoke vinyl. The vinyl is dead quiet. It's half speed mastered by Barry Grint at Alchemy Mastering at Air Studios. Uh, digital. It's a Sony release. It's going to be digital. It's the thing is with this, 
as opposed to the Ornette Coleman. The Ornette Coleman is going to be expensive and pricey if you find an original. You can find copies of Nebraska super, super cheap. This is not, you know, this is my original. This is not an expensive record to hunt down an original first pressing of, you know, in the United States anywhere. It's maybe 10 bucks to find a nice, clean, original copy of that record. Maybe 15 bucks. Yeah, so cheap. I would stick, me personally, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stick with the original. I'm not a Bruce completist. I don't have to have everything. I'm going to stick with the original. The Ornette Coleman, I'm going to add to the collection because it is a fantastic uh, record for the money. Makes more sense than, you know, a digital pressing of a record that you can find on the cheap. So, yeah, I'll bring the Ornette Coleman back to that store. I'm going to clean it. I'll bring it back and put it in the collection. So let me show you some stuff that is actually going to stay in the collection that I've already done all this with. First one is Little Richard. This came in a collection that I had purchased maybe a couple years back, a year and a half ago. I showed it on YouTube. It had a lot of EPs in it. It had a lot of uh, singles in it, but the guy spent a lot of time and money. I don't know how well that's going to show. But this is just a super clean Nearman copy. Love Little Richard. And let me tell you, as a record collector, finding these original pressings, are these early pressings in general, if you find the 50s, early 60s copies that are really clean, uh, they're hard. I mean, it's really hard. You know, you can find a lot of these Little Richard records, Chuck Berry, you can find them, Bo Diddley records, James Brown records, you can find them. But finding clean copies, look at that cover. Finding them clean is extremely hard. And when you do, you know, I keep it. And if I find really clean ones, I'll keep the label variations and everything. So I'm adding that to my collection. I got a full run of Pat Martino from the Tucson collection. This is a good one. Bayana. The Clear Evidence. A Psychedelic Excursion Through the Magical Mysteries of the Koran. This is an unbelievably killer, fantastic guitar playing, but this is a fantastic guitar, jazz guitar record. I'm not a huge flute fan, but the flute that's on this is really tasteful. It's been a fun listen. I've listened to it quite a few times here recently. Uh, really clean copy on the Blue Prestige label. Not sure how well that's coming out. But I'm surprised a lot of his stuff hasn't gotten a high-quality reissue. This seems to me like this is right up Vinyl Me Please's alley as far as doing reissue a reissue on. Uh, really fun record. I recommend it. It's not the cheapest record. It's, a you know, an original. This is over 100 bucks. But that's been a fun listen. One I didn't have in my collection. A lot of the other ones I did have in my collection, so I'm going to kind of sort out the better copies. I, you know, and I do that a lot with records that uh, are rare, records that I like. I'll always look for the cleanest copy. But in that case, a lot of stuff makes its way back to the store for sale. This is, I'm getting to the point where I'm turning into like a Pink Floyd completist of the premium stuff. So when it comes to collecting Pink Floyd, I'm looking for really clean original U.S. copies, U.K. copies, uh, and then like, quadraphonic copies, the CD4 stuff. This is just a variation of Adam Hart Mother quadraphonic that I didn't have. I dig the quadraphonic mixes. So a lot of you guys, if you're not familiar with quadraphonic in general, quadraphonic was like a 70s surround sound, four channel. You can play quadraphonic on a two channel system. When you play quadraphonic on a two channel system, you're essentially getting an alternate mix. So you're gonna hear stuff in the mix that you've probably never heard before, and you're going to have stuff that's missing. So if you're a fan of a record, if you're a fan of Adam Hart Mother, they did Dark Side of the Moon, they did Wish You Were Here. If you're a fan of these records, you're going to get to hear them kind of in a different way. Sometimes it's better, sometimes it's not. It just depends on how much they were mixing for the quad mix. So I do when I do shootouts, I typically talk about quad mixes. I don't include it because it's really... It's not the same thing. It's kind of like the Marvin Gaye Detroit mix. It's a totally different mix. Like the Pink Floyd, although I prefer the new Pink Floyd Animals, it's a different mix. It kind of doesn't belong in the same conversation. 
but I like listening to alternate mixes, and uh, I'm a big fan of the quadraphonic stuff. Not a huge REM fan at for this period. Love early 80s REM into the early 90s. But I got a copy of Reveal. This is just sealed. I didn't have it in my collection, and again, I'm kind of a completist. So unfortunately, it's got a little bit of a ding corner, but it's sealed. I'll throw it on the shelf. These two records, I think, complete my REM uh, collection. But I also got Around the Sun. Still sealed as well. This came out, I think, 2004. But, you know, kind of the tail end of REM before they broke up. Again, not a huge fan, but the completest in me wants to have all the albums. Okay, so this album I just happened upon came in the store in a little collection, and I looked at the cover. I'm, you know, I wasn't familiar with the record at all. I'm like, well, this looks pretty good. It's uh, Harold Mayburn. Greasy kid stuff. It's on Prestige. So I'm looking at this record. I'm like, oh, this is pretty cool. So pull the record out. Looking at the uh, track listing. Uh, I want you back. And I love jazz covers of R&B, rock, or, you know, pop songs of the day. Uh, Jackson, uh, Jackson 5, I want you back. So put it on. Great album. The cover's great. You know, of uh, the cover of I Want You Back is great. Lee Morgan is on it. Makes a guest appearance. Joe Jones on guitar. Buster Williams on bass. The rest of the album is good besides the cover, but the title, the cover, not the cover, but the covers they do on the album, I Want You Back, kind of drew me to listen to it and sample it. And then I'm like, all right, this is great. Take this home. But yeah on the original Prestige label. I'm essentially, for all intensive purposes, have been trying to put a run of a few of my favorite labels together. So, you know, a complete run of First Pressing, Prestige, Blue Note, uh, Riverside, Impulse. I'm closer on Blue Note than anything else of putting a complete run together, especially by the time you get to this era of Prestige. I don't have a ton of the 60s and the 70s stuff. I've got a lot of the 7,000 series stuff, you know, that original 50s era prestige stuff. But yeah, this has been a fun record. You can actually sample this. I think it's on YouTube as well. Okay, this is a record that I picked up in the Netherlands. The dealer next to me had it, and I lost the damn record. It was in a box somewhere, you know, it got misplaced. When I got back from the Netherlands... Uh, Den Bosch, the largest record fair in the world. There's a video of it online here. You can watch me kind of walking through the aisles. But this, the dealer next to me, I think I had a copy of Marvin Gaye, What's Going On. And I ended up getting, I traded him. I think I got that, this, Michael Jackson's Invincible. Original first pressing. I got a copy of this. I think I got some cash in, you know, we did a trade. Uh, Italian dealer, just chatting. Like, hey, what do you want? You know, made a deal. But uh, I think I'm missing one of his records, and then that'll, you know, complete my original run of Michael Jackson titles. So, yeah, this, I found the box. It was in there. And, uh, yeah. Real clean, in the shrink. Vinyl's like near mint. Okay. This is a heavy. This is a record that has been on my want list for... 10 years. One of the rarest, most, now well, I won't say most desirable, but it is by far and away one of the rarest, most elusive jazz records you will ever find. If you're a jazz collector, there's just certain records the jazz guys are looking for that are really expensive and really hard to find. This is one of them. I showed this in a video, but it actually had been sitting on a uh, shelf waiting to be clean and then kind of processed into the collection, but an original copy of Roland Kirk's Triple Threat on King. And this is actually a BG Plus copy, which is even more elusive. This is an extremely difficult record to find. I can't tell you how long I've waited to find one of these. Maybe two of these things come up a year. Typically VG are much, much worse. You don't find VG plus copies 
of this record. Gorgeous cover. Look at that cover. Killer. It's been reissued. You can get the reissue for five bucks. I mean, it's you're in it for just the music. And again, I think this is one of his, if not best record, uh, maybe second best. If you're in it for just the music, you can get this record on the cheap. It was reissued, different cover. I don't think it's ever gotten a reissue. Maybe the Japanese did a reissue of this record in this particular cover, but that was more recently. But as far as, you know, if you're a jazz collector looking for originals, this took so many, so many years. Oddly enough, when I sold, <laughs> when I bought it, the uh, seller had regrets and contacted me and he wanted to buy it back. I'm like, oh, I just, I couldn't do it. I kind of felt bad, but it had been on, like I said, it's a record that I had hunted for 10 years. It was in my hand. I was playing it. I was loving it. I was fondling it. And it's like, calls me back and he's like, Mike, can I buy that back from you? Like, I just couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. So, yeah, Roland Kirk's Triple Threat. This is a record that used to go for ridiculous sums of money, but you can actually get this much more reasonably. This is Charlie Parker, Dial 201. This is from 1948. This is an extremely old 10 inch, very, very old. So, I think this era of jazz is kind of with the modern buyers has started to fall out of favor. So I remember 15, 20 years ago. Now this is the second pressing, but still 1948 with the original just had a textured back. Very quickly after that, they're like, let's advertise on the back of the record, which was smart. Who knows? Maybe they rushed out the first copy. Maybe something that was lost to time being that this is from 1948. It's super old. So this is significant for a few reasons. It's a very early LP, one of the earliest LPs. Keep in mind, original LPs were 10 inches, right? Although they did, Dial did put a 12 inch LP out there. But this is very significant because it is the very first time, to my knowledge, and I'm almost positive, it's the very first time Miles Davis appeared on an LP. So let's see, he is credited Let's see, where is he credited? He's not even credited on here. He's credited on the actual disc. So this is nothing more than a collection of, I want to say, three dial uh, 78s from 46 to when this came out, 48. And there we go. So on side A, you've got Miles Davis credited as the trumpet player. On the B side, you also have... Let me see. So you got Charlie, but yet you got, you know, you have Miles Davis. So this is a pretty clean copy. This is a very strong VG. Maybe most sellers would consider this VG plus, but this is something I've always wanted to add. Originals were pressed at Plasticite. This is always something I've wanted to add to my collection because of its historical significance. I've got all of this session stuff. They did it as a mosaic box set. I have it as a mosaic box set, but yeah, how cool is it? The very, very first Miles Davis LP. Essentially as an accompaniment, but still. This is a record that used to go for two grand. I got this for a couple hundred bucks. So, you know, again, I just, this, and he does just, at this point in time, new tunes, but <laughs> these are, Absolute iconic jazz standards at this point in time. He does ornithology on this in a night in Tunisia, which, you know, as far as jazz, they're, they're standards at this point. But here it is in an original 1948 10-inch LP. So super excited for this. The historical significance is huge. Sounds pretty good too. It's not a bad sound for being 1948 and being something of repress, essentially a compilation of 78. It's fantastic. Sound is really good. Not modern tone poet audio file or anything, but okay. This is a record that I've had in my collection for ever, but I've never had one of this caliber as far as being clean. This is an original capital birth of the cool Miles Davis. A lot of early miles in this uh, particular collection. So let me show you, look how clean this is. I, 
for some reason, you can find, now if you got the money, you can find clean 1500 series blue notes. They're out there. You can find a lot of records clean. Finding this record in this shape has been just such an elusive thing for me for years. I don't know what it is about the capital stuff. But yeah, look how nice that cover is. Let's see. And the disc. I don't know how that's going to show on camera, but look at that beautiful near mint copy. So it's nice because sometimes if I get a record like this, if I got a nice cover, uh, and maybe that not the nicest disc, I'll keep keep it because I'll have another one that's maybe the second pressing, but it has a nice disc, but not the nicest cover or whatever the case might be. I love when I find these really clean first pressing originals because a lot of times I can cut down two to three spaces on my shelf. And then I want to have three different variations of this. And this is a record that has not really been reissued uh, very much. That sonically, you know, sonically sounding good. Bernie Grunman did it for classic records. That sounds fantastic, but an original in the Bernie Grunman, yeah, most of the modern represses have been pretty awful. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, and last, this is a Liberty pressing. I have an original of this. It's not in perfect shape. This Liberty pressing of Herbie Hancock's. Uh, Inventions and Dimensions is in, you know, near mint shape. So similar to the Miles Davis Birth of the Cool, I have an original first pressing of this. It's in VG shape. But I'll keep something like this because it's in a root, it's, you know, it's a Rudy Van Gelder mastering. Uses the exact same metal parts. Not pressed that plasticide, so not on as high quality vinyl, but it's near mint. And I'd rather play something like this over the VG copy, and then one day I'll just hunt out, you know, uh, an original of this and clean off the shelf. Blue Note has, what is it? It's either part of the 80th series or the classic record series. It sounds better than all of these anyways. That's the one I'm probably generally gonna listen to, but every now and then I like to put the originals on. They have a different vibe, they have a different sound, and I enjoy it. Yeah, Herbie Hancock. So yeah, that's what's going into the collection this week. And it's not all that's going into the collection this week, but this is kind of some of the stuff I've curated from the three boxes of stuff throughout the course of the week that I've brought home. Some of it is uh, not stuff that people would want to sit here and watch on YouTube. It's snooze stuff, you know, snooze fest stuff. But uh, this is the better stuff from the boxes, or I thought things that I like to talk about. But yeah, if you like this video, this is the second one of these I've done. Let me know. I'm unsure about it. I hate talking about just the stuff that comes out every single week. I wanted to get a little bit deeper into the weeds, so that's why I decided to do these videos. All right, guys, subscribe to the channel. Until next time.